Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Latin American Directions. My name is Nicholas Sussman, and welcome to our show to discuss the most current topics in Latin America and the impact for our region. Today, we have the pleasure to have with us as guests uh, to have Maria Monica La Torre. Maria Monica is a lawyer from Universidad de los Andes in Bogota, Colombia, with a postgraduate degree in financial legislation. She has focused her professional experience in financial law, both in the law firm and banking sectors. And today we're going to discuss a very fascinating, interesting topic, which is financial technology, financial access, and the impact it has on poverty and development. Maria Monica, welcome to Latin American Directions. It's a pleasure to have you here. Hi, Nicolas. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. It's such an honor. I'm very, very grateful to be here and um, well, happy, happy to talk to you. Great. So Maria Monica, let's start with some basic questions to set the ground for our audience, right? So now we hear fintech, crypto, a lot of new terms in the financial world, right? Yeah. And now it's mixing with technology. So very briefly, what is financial technology or fintech if I'm saying it properly? Yeah. Um, so fintech basically refers to the idea that um, financial services can be provided through technology. So it's the idea that um, there are new business models, new ways to provide traditional financial services through um, technology. That's, that's basically it. Right. And why is this better or different from traditional banking? What's the need of this new fintech world? Well, I think uh, it's not necessarily better, um, but it's how, like, like somehow how the the market's been developing and and like the new um, tendencies of the market have been leading leading there, right? So we have been seeing that um, the more traditional sectors of the of the, of the financial sector have had to adapt quickly to these new um, technologies, these new ideas, these new business models more focused on the digital era and on um, new digital um, um, tools. So I, I don't think one is like better than the other. It's just how the market's been developing currently. Right. And how does this change the financial game? How is this different from traditional banking? Well, I think, um, well, the first thing that comes to mind is um, financial inclusion. So um, traditionally, and, and the traditional financial services um, have been uh, neglecting, let's say, or um, forgetting a important part of the population that has been underserved. So let's talk about more vulnerable, um, poor, segments of society and also, um, for example, small, medium um, enterprises that haven't had normally access to traditional financial services, right? So I think this fintech revolution has allowed for these um, traditionally forgotten segments of business and of society to have access, right? to financial services and products. And that's been fascinating, I think. So I think that's one of the most most um, important things and how it's changed the, the, the deal and how it's changed the dynamic in the financial system. Right, uh, and this may seem a bit obvious perhaps, but why is it important for people to have access and use the financial system? Well, that's a very, very good question actually. Um, it is, it has been proven that financial inclusion promotes financial development, economic development. It helps people have more access and, become, uh, and let's say um, it helps for increased availability of economic resources in the economy. So that's the first thing, right? Um, it is also an enabler for um, sustainable development. So let's let's talk about, for example, the sustainable development goals. Financial inclusion has been um, proven to be one of the enablers for the sustainable development goals because it helps people come out of poverty um, because they can have access to more resources and to more services. It helps um, promote 
education, for example, financial education, which is um, one of the most important sustainable development goals, um, it helps improve female empowerment, right? Because um, when we help women have access to financial services, then women have more power and more control over their financial situation, right? So it helps a lot um, in development, and that's why it's become so very important for people to have access to financial services. Right, right. Let, let's bring this into more specific and perhaps daily life examples, right? So when I imagine financial access before, right, I just imagine the person going to the bank with its folder, with its documents, trying to get a loan, right? For yeah. Um, yeah, a short business, they want a small business they want to create or something like that. And they have the interview with the person at the bank and then they they get an answer of yes or no, right? Um, and that that's financial access. How does this change in in, in digital banking, in, in technological banking? Does it work the same? Is it easier, for example, to get a loan? How does this improve from traditional banking, the situation of, of people? Yeah, so um, I think let's take one step back. So the first thing is um, financial inclusion is, is um, it's firstly about giving people access to the most basic um, financial services. So before a loan even, let's guarantee that people have access to savings accounts, right? So they can store money and they can um, save, they can plan for the future, right? Um, they can have a, a more structured um, management of, the, of their finances, right? Um, so th that's uh, on, the, on, the, on the one hand. Then um, on the second hand, on, the, on this digital era, we have seen that people have been able to be closer to the financial services, right? So for example, in rural areas, in areas where traditionally, um, a branch of a bank would be very expensive to install if people just have access to a phone or the internet, well, they can have access to financial services without the need to, of them being um, seated in front of a person telling them what to do, how to do it, um, what, what they can do with that. So, so I think that's been fascinating. It's allowing people, um, yeah, to, to really, get access without tradition without the traditional means of the banking system right 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 and how does this work right because we've seen worldwide uh the i would say a boom of new financial institutions right which they don't even have offices as you say you apply from the phone uh, how do you see this situation how does this model is operational and also provides trust, which I would say is one of the key questions of this, right? Who am I giving my money to? Which I, I would say is one of the main questions we have when we go to a bank, right? Who, who is this person I'm entrusting with my with my hard-earned savings, right? Yeah, totally. And and that actually has been one of the challenges of these new um, digital revolution in financial services, right? Because, well, people are still very wary of where they put their money and how they invest their money, right? And we have also seen that this digital era has allowed for more fraud or, or different um, new, I am, um, ways of, of, of defrauding people, right? Um, so how does it work? Well. I'm going to talk a little bit about the efforts that have been done in the past and how um, the digital area has allowed for, for, for example, um, more financial inclusion and more access to financial services. So the, the first thing is it has become a priority for governments, right? So governments have found out that if people have more access to financial services, that will contribute to economic growth. So there have been products and services that have been leveraged by governments themselves. So for example, um, if there are government payments that the government is giving to more underprivileged segments of the population, if the government ensures that their payments will only come through a savings account that has been um, promoting 
for people to open savings accounts, right? And that has include that has um, promoted more bankability in uh, in different and traditionally forgotten sectors of of society. Um, the the um, the other aspect is we have allowed mobile financial services to, to thrive. So we have taken advantage of already existing technologies like telecommunications to leverage and to allow for mobile financial services. So people can make payments through their phones, um, through text messages, you can um, send money. So, and this has been, for example, a great success um, in, in sub-Saharan countries and specifically in Kenya, it was a great um, case of success where people had access to mobile banking in places in rural places where of course there weren't any branches of the banks, but people had access to, um, to a signal on their phone, right? So they could handle their money. Um, we have welcomed new business models um for financial inclusion so for example small medium enterprises have promoted micro credits and micro indebtedness that have allowed for segments that have traditionally not passed all those benchmarks that traditional banks set for them to have access to credit for them to have access to loans so it, it's been quite quite um refreshing to see this this happen um so yeah i think that's how basically it's worked so far um of course we're still inventing many much of this um because as technology is evolving very quickly well we are we are having to figure out how it works how we protect the customers how we protect the money from these um from these these new business models without hindering and without um putting like a stop in their development, right? So it's it's still very much under construction. Right, right. And uh, now let me play a bit of devil's advocate here. Uh, and let's pick up on the common beliefs perhaps people who are unfamiliar with the financial system have, and is that banks are not reliable, banks only want their money, and they're not gonna receive any benefits. What are you gonna say to these people and why would they choose now to go into, into uh, this technology supported banking instead of traditional banking? What Does it bring any advantages? Is it more trustworthy? What would you say to these people? Um, well, firstly, I think um, it, it will facilitate much of what we before hated about the traditional banking system, right? So you don't have to go to a physical place to make a line for two hours to just have access to your bank account. You just can access it from your phone, right? And you can have your resources available at any moment, at any time, for as long as you have internet, internet right? So I think that's the very first thing. Um, well, the second thing is, um, of course, banking is a business, but that doesn't mean that there aren't any um, protections around banks to make sure that people uh, receive sustainable and responsible products and services, right? So there are quite a lot of regulations in place to make sure that people's savings, people money um, is, is safe, that banks have the right um, strength to back those um, products, right? They have the the the, the enough. Um, how do we say it? Enough strength, solvency, to make sure that people won't lose their money. Um, so so I think even though we cannot forget that banking is a traditional like business, there are a lot of protections in place to make sure that the people's money is protected and is safe, right? And well, these, these new technologies just had made it easier for people to access it and just had made it easier for people to, to, to have access to, to products and services that previously were limited to a very specific segment of the population. I think that's the key aspect of all of this, right? Um, and I, I would like to make like a, a quick propaganda here. And it is, I think the digital 
financial services have allowed for people to have a much better financial education, right? If you don't have to go to a financial advisor in a bank for you to have access to a service or for you to get to know the services that the banks or the, the, the fintechs are offering, well, that's, we're, we're all winning, right? Because from your phone, you can see what you can do with your money. How can you invest it in a safe way, right? Um, so, so I think it's also been great for, for improving financial education and for giving people access to information um, on financial services, which was, I think, previously was very limited. And people just, like, they went to the bank, deposited their money, but they didn't know what happened after that, right? We now have more access to information, and information is more transparent nowadays. So I think that is also key, and that is also something that should give people, um, um, like, the tranquility to go and, and deposit their money in, in the banks, so. Right, and well, the question now is, is it working? Are you having an increase in, in the amount of clients? Is it growing business model? Is it competitive against traditional banking? How does this situation of traditional versus new banking is looking like? Well, the first thing we need to say um, is it has definitely, improve the panorama in terms of financial inclusion, right? So um, right, right now, the numbers have improved significantly. 76% of the global population have an account, are, are, have an account, a bank account, right? That of course leaves still a, a very large 24% that we can well improve. Um, but this new era has allowed for people to have access for many people to have access to, um, to, to financial services. And it has also presented as a very good business opportunity, right? Because it, it, it has become um, a priority for governments. So it has become a great opportunity for investment, right? If you can invest in financial inclusion, well, there is a, a unattended segment of the population that you can, um, how do you say it? you can focus on um and and that is definitely um has infinite infinite potential right um and the other thing is um it has become for example a huge huge opportunity of growth for small and medium enterprises right so we have seen that um traditional banking sectors are well they are evolving a lot, but they are still focusing on the traditional parts of the financial sector, right? So it has left a very large portion of unattended population um, to be, at, to be um, attended to by the, the small and medium enterprises. So it has allowed for startups, for fintech startups to be very successful for them to grow and for them to not only grow um, their business, but also provide a good service to people that previously didn't have access to it. So I, I think it's um, it's it's a win-win, however you see it, right? Right, right. And in terms of global use, uh, the appearance of these new banks, of these new financial services is more frequent or popular in what we call the global south or developing countries, or is it something occurring worldwide? in a similar manner? Well, it's it's something occurring worldwide. And the thing is, of course, um, in, in more developed countries or historically more developed countries, people have had more access traditionally to um, financial products and services, right? It's where people have been more vulnerable when people are poor, where people are in more rural areas, um, where people are in conflict, that they haven't had the opportunity to have access to all those products, right? So it has presented as a great opportunity for growth in developing countries um, because, well, it's where traditionally there have there has been more space to grow in that aspect, right? Um, so, for example, um, the the financial the financial the gender gap has been more pronounced. A, in developing countries than in historically developed countries. So it has presented as a good opportunity to um, promote uh, more female access to 
um, to financial products and services. Um, so, so I think even though it's been a worldwide phenomenon, it has really been focused um, or not focused, but it has proven to have infinite potential in developing countries where there is more space to grow and where there, there have been more traditionally forgotten segments of the population um, that haven't had access to traditional financial services, right? Right. Right, and it's very interesting what you say about the link between access to fi the financial system, to financial services, and first, personal growth, and second, development. Uh, could you explain us a bit this link? Why using banks, having the savings account, having access to the financial system is going to improve my personal situation first? How is this better from having my money under the mattress or in a shoebox under the bed? Well, of course. Um, first, I think because it allows for, um, for you to have more knowledge on how to manage your money, right? To have more planning. Um, so if you just have a daily wage and you spend it every day, you don't have any kind of planning for the future. You don't have any kind of savings for any emergencies. So I think having access to, for example, a savings account is a better way of planning and of having a better control of your finances, right? So that is the first, first aspect. Um, what I was saying at the beginning, um, it is going to, for people to have more access to financial products and services is going to make um, more economic resources available in the system. So what does that mean? Um, if I am a small uh, business owner, or if I am a female entrepreneur, if I have access to credit, for example, I have more chances of making my business grow, right? And if I have more chances of making my business grow, well, I have more chances of making more wealth, of producing more money, and of me being a, a, a a bigger part of the of the economy. So I think that is really key. Um, it has allowed for an easier also way of the, for the money to flow, right? So if you have a savings account, well, you can easily receive payments and send money to other people without the need of having it in cash, right? So um, the the other day this happened to me. I was in a small in a small town here in Colombia, where normally you wouldn't be able to pay with your credit card, of course, because people didn't have like the, the little thing where you pay with your card. But the guy said to me, I, 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 I don't have the, um, the little thing to receive your card, but I have a QR code that will allow for you to pay with your card with your phone, right? In a small business, in a small town in Colombia. So that opens the opportunity for their business to grow and to develop, right? Um, and the flow of money, of course, becomes easier. Um, also, for example, we have seen that, well, the, our world is, every day is more globalized and the financial system is very globalized and is very interdependent. So we have seen that um, having a, more digital financial services has allowed for money to move easier um, from one place to another, decreasing, for example, the, the transactional costs, which is something that has traditionally been um, crazy. So I think all of those small aspects end up helping um, the bigger purpose, which is economic um, development, sustainable economic development, right? Right, so bottom line, more people using the financial system creates more flow of cash and that leads into development, right? That's that's the yeah. story. That's that's yeah. that's amazing. More flow of cash, but also like more access to cash. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, that's 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 really great. Um, and uh, well, just to finish, how do you see the future of, of fintech and, and financial access in our region? What's a closing message you would leave to the audience and perhaps a message for the people that are still a bit shy or reluctant to go for these new banking models? Um, okay, so some key takeaways, perhaps. 
Um, the, the first thing is, I think right now governments are having a more strategic um, uh, development or of their financial inclusion um, um, services and the financial sectors has assessed very, like is, is assessing better the situation. So if we know what we're working with, with data, then we can develop effective strategies to, to pursue um, more financial inclusion, right? So I think that's, that's the first takeaway. The second is um, we are focusing more on products and providers for underserved segments of the population, right? So if we can promote more pro products and more providers that are serving specific underserved segments of the population when we can help strengthen our economies and we can help um, strengthen and, 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 and enable more development. Um, the, the, the other, I think, takeaway is we are promoting more financial education, which is something I think key for economic development and for sustainable development. If people know how to manage their money, well, they're more likely to manage it in, a, in an adequate way, right? Um, we are also trying to promote more micro, small and medium enterprises for them to make it easier for people to have access to, 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 to financial services, right? And for your last question, that what, what can you say to people that are still a little bit reluctant? Um, just bear in mind what I was saying earlier that really there are many regulations in place designed to really protect the consumer and to make um, the consumer the center of all of this because in the, at the end of the day, companies are providing services, but it's, it's just for the customers, right? So let's not forget that there are many regulations in place to protect your money, um, there are many regulations in place to protect your data um, and to ensure that the companies that are providing these services are providing them in a responsible, sustainable, ethical way, and that we are not, we're trying not to allow any, any um, defrauders into, into the system. So just um, bear in mind that regulators, regulators and companies are working very hard to protect your money and to provide good services because, well, if we don't have confidence, well, this, this system simply doesn't work. Well, I think that's a great way to end our show. Maria Monica, thank you so much. Thank you for enlightening us with something that could seem complicated, but at the end improves our access and our education. It was a pleasure to have you in Latin American Directions and for our audience, we'll see each other in two weeks. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me, Nicolas. It's always a pleasure. And well, whatever you need, I'm always here available to talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.